Welcome back. With me is Fred Van Dyke. Uh, Fred, I think I first met Fred on a on a bar. Oh, well, it's a boat, a boat and a bar at the Bristol 2014 conference. I remember being very impressed at this guy who was very geeky and technical and could speak at length on all sorts of issues, as long as they were technical. Fred is a great contributor in the Plone community. He's also a great singer and tap dancer. Uh, sadly, you won't see this um, unless you wanna pay. Uh, if you sponsor the Plone Foundation, I will make sure you get that video. Uh, so Fred is gonna be talking on a very new, well, a relatively new tool for Plone migrations and a new use case for them. So with that, Fred, please take it away. So thank you, Kim. And no, you can't be bribed, right? Not for that video from the pre-recording. So hello, welcome. My name is Fred van Dijk. Um, I'm presenting Collective Export Import. If you have been watching this track for the last hour, you might be thinking there's something wrong because the previous talk was about exactly the same subject, but then by Philip Bauer, the creator. Um, Philip and I, uh, I, I've been helping Philip together with my colleague Maurits and other plonistas to get export import into shape. And we thought, Exporting and importing and migration, you can never talk enough about it. So I will do exactly the same talk again, but then in 30 minutes and in my way and not in Philips. So you can hopefully get another, but same view on this. Uh, and I've got the excuse for this is that we found an extra new way uh, to use collective export import, because with the fixes we've done in the summer, we can also uh, start using it for staging content between clone sites. And that has always been a bit painful uh, uh, in the system. So my name is Fred van Dijk. I'm from Zest, the Netherlands. Uh, we are based in Rotterdam. Well, I'm actually still in Rotterdam because since COVID, our team has been working worldwide. And the goals of this talk, I'd like to give you a technical conceptual walkthrough of export import to know what is where. The details uh, uh, you should have already seen uh, by Philip but to just show you a kind of roadmap and place on the uh, on where to put what, I'm going to do a bit more conceptual, which, uh, well, the main problem I had in the beginning was understand the ordering of steps. I will show you some banana peels. I will show you some frustration of mine uh, so you don't repeat. Um, and I will demonstrate this advanced use case to extend export import, which we did to uh, be able to stage some content. Migrations can be fun again. Dixit P. Bauer, sort of in another universe. Um, what I found out, I mean, we've been doing clone migrations for like, like 15 to 18 years. Uh, a clone has been constantly in new development. You have to, if you want to stick and have the new features, you have to upgrade. We've had a lot of migrations uh, in the past. And this same P. Bauer created a very cool, nice in place migration and has been championing that uh, for uh, quite a few years. But there are some things there that make uh, migrations not fun again. So that's maybe what Philip meant. Collective export import is a new uh, way to export import. Philip has already said it. Uh, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, we use Plone REST API and it's uh, JSON deserializers. So we walk over the content called Plone REST API uh, serializer on all content items, save them basically into a JSON file. And when we go to uh, the other side, we import those JSONs again, call the serializer, and we should have our content. So that's what basically Philip explained. But please note, create an empty package 11th of February, that's 2021. So collective export import is rather new, but we had it, uh, it works. So how I found about it, I started a migration in autumn of 2020 with an in-place migration. It was a Plone 4.3 site, but probably there was data in there from Plone 2.5 or Plone 3. And I did all the usual stuff that you should do with an in-place migration, clean up first, strip your uh, source site using upgrade steps. Then you move data FS and blobs from the strip data FS to uh, uh, your version where you want to migrate to, Plone 5.2 run ZDB convert to convert the data FS from Python 2 pickles to Python 3 pickles. And after that, you can also run the plone up content types upgrade, which is part of core plone. And then you're done. Unless you find a banana peel and another banana peel and another banana peel, because, because we are still kind of migrating the actual data, which are pickled Python object instances, there can be some surprises there. There can be some old 
uh, uh, meta storage still in, in tools in Plome, and all those things are migrated and might trip you up. They don't have to, but they, in my case, they did, and I just kind of canceled uh, the migration uh, in December to, be to, get, to take a break. And around February, I saw Philips post an announcement and was like, well, maybe, maybe that might be interesting. So I looked into it. Um, I looked a bit more and around April, May, I started uh, uh, after some first contributions and testing it. I started using it for the migration I gave up with uh, on the in-place migration. And part of the part of the problem I found with collect uh, with with an in-place migration is that when you have a larger database, uh, the, the the time to run the steps becomes increasingly larger and larger. So you get a very slow feedback loop. So the drawbacks, unknown unknowns. You don't really know what's in your database. If you have a completely default clone chart, it's fine. But as I said, data structures and conflict from older add-ons, they're still lurking there. You pickle and unpickle, uh, you have configuration for components that are not longer in there and they break your migration flow. And it's, for me, part of my per uh, personal frustration is that it's not possible to really estimate if you're done until you're done. And you, you keep finding banana peels and when the banana peels are there, well, then you're finished, right? So you migrate to the site, it works, the end user are happy, they start editing content, and then the first tracebacks start coming in because you never know what's still lurking there deep down in your ZRDB, which is calling on the new code. And that was something we had in previous, also in place migrations, for example, in Plone 4 from archetypes to dexterity and also from archetypes to Plone 5. So in place migration, unguessed debatable iterations on banana peels without a clear view on time needed for a way forward, the age of anxiety. Um, another drawback that I'd like to point people is that you require an intermediate Python 2, Python 3 compatible environment in Plone 5.2 to be able to run ZDB convert. So you have to have your code Python 2, Python 3 compatible. And then when it's done, you can strip away all the Python 2, Python 3 compatible stuff, which is part of what we're now doing with uh, Plone 6 anyway. But this is also something to consider. And what if you want to migrate beyond 5.2? Then you have to do those steps as well. So all the bad shouting about in-place migration, it's not bad. It has had a lot of work to make it stable. It works for default Plone sites. It works for the default content types, but who here has a default plan site? And how old is it? And which editors and webmasters abused it with add-ons and not in, uninstalled them? Or there, I, I've seen, for example, uh, a, a traceback on some Plon 2 uh, discussion objects somehow popping up, and then the whole migration was part. So it's not right, it's not wrong, but there's something better. And our migration pope, uh, P. Bauer, was right because he created this. So what do we have? We have an ETL transformation. This is the basic theory of an ETL transformation. You extract something from the old site, you store it, you then transform it into something uh, more suitable, and then you load it up into your new environment. Um, this is, by the way, the same thing as uh, Transmogrifier has been doing for years. Uh, Transmogrifier is also a very nice tool. We have been using it for migrations, uh, but I must say my colleague Maurits uh, figured out how it all worked. I never really did. And I must say the, the collective export import, which, we, uh, which you've seen already with Philip, is much cleaner and simpler uh, in its concept. So if you wanna convert or look at ETL transformation to uh, collective export import, this is collective export input. We kind of skip the transform step. So from old, we export all the content into JSON files. And then we load the JSON files back into the new site. And until we are done with catching all the exceptions, uh, or you want to have your own fixes again, on the new site, you can have some browser views or other upgrade steps uh, that still fix your content in another way. And the beauty of this is, is that you can do it on the new site only. So out of the box, from three archetypes, when we export uh, uh, the content, we have an extra uh, checkbox, which Philip showed you, that you can 
already fixed some content. So it is in actually uh, dexterity, the our new uh, basic uh, uh, base content type system already on the export. Then we load it up again, and the, the you can uh, customize these steps with the dict hooks uh, that uh, Philip already showed you. And we're going to see another example of dict hooks later on in the second part of this presentation. This is what we're still working on. We're still trying to improve collective export import. Uh, we have the second load step, and then you run fixes afterwards. But what we'd like to have, at least for all the default content types and default situations in uh, Plone 5.2 Classic, we want to have uh, the portlets uh, and another subject is maybe mosaic layouts uh, and other things fixed. And that's still ongoing work to get those not in an extra step that we're now doing uh, manually, but we like to feed those things into uh, the, the load step. So the benefits of using, well, extract load uh, and maybe fix and doing small transforms on the extract and on the load is you don't need the intermediate Python 2, Python 3 environment. So we can use the same principle later if we uh, are not migrating from Plone 3 or 4 to Plone 5 2, but we're going to Plone 6. Um, you, it, collective export import itself is just one add-on which you install in your own uh, old site and that's that's it you don't change anything else in your old site you're not going to change data there beforehand to clean it up or remo un remove unwanted add-ons you can export the data in any order so you can export uh, the content and export the metadata on the content and what i didn't mention here you can also leave out content types and that's an important thing it's not an all or nothing you can just say look we've only got uh, five or six uh, collections in this old site um, why are we putting in all the work and the possible risks of what's happening there if we can recreate those collections in 10 minutes on the destination side? So if you have some use cases with some content that's still left there, just leave it out. If you have a, a kind of content type that has a new, completely new dexterity implementation and it's only three or four or 10 items, you can choose not to export and import them, but just create them when the site is done. That's also the freedom you have here much easier. Uh, you can write the fixed code in Python 3 because we only run uh, the export on the on the uh, on the source side. You don't have to. You can, of course, also uh, if there, if you're with custom data, then you'll have to do some Python 2 export stuff because otherwise it doesn't get out. But for most things, you can fix up things also on the last stage. And I must say, it's very satisfying to see your site in in plain JS text files. I always had this concept of ZOAP being a kind of black box and you put things in through the, uh, through the web uh, when you started with, as a newbie with Flown. Uh, and then it's in there and you can't get it out unless you go through the web interface again. And this does make me, okay, it's, it's just text. Everything is just text if you want to. So technical tech bits, tidbits. I've mentioned, um, Collective export input is not big because we have those serializers and deserializers. It has been battle tested uh, by uh, the whole Volta front end project because they have been using those exact serializers and deserializers uh, uh, for years when they want to uh, export uh, a content item uh, to, the, to the front end runtime. Um, but there is one thing here, and that is that we have to do two phase export import. Um, we are first exporting the base content tree. And then we reply metadata because the elephant in the room here, which is always with migrations, is you have the chicken and egg problem. And the chicken and egg problem is on metadata. So if you start saying, okay, just export an item, export another item, and that item is a folder and says, look, but I have a default page and the default page is an item, that item is not there yet. If you want to order all the items in a folder, all the ordering has to be there before you can do the real ordering. The relations between items, if you refer to another item using a relation, if the other relation is, if the other item is not there yet, you can start try to create something in the relation catalog with functions. But it might say, hey, look, relation to what? Uh, local roles, ownership, portals. So that's why we have this, this two phase uh, uh, export import. We first import the content. And then we kind of import the other metadata things. There was one huge improvement done, uh, I'm not sure, May, June, summer by uh, Philip, 
where we, uh, where we figured out a way to export all the content in the right way so that it can also be created again in one step on the import. Before you first had to export first all folderish items. And when all the folderish items, so all the branches were there, then you could import the leaves as well. And uh, it's just finding the right order, starting with a top and then having a, a smart way. So we have now a content tree export uh, where you don't have to export uh, all the content items one by one, but you can just export them in one go and the algorithm will figure out how to do that. Part two, because of this uh, now content tree, you have just one JSON file with all your content in there. Philip already explained that you can choose to have uh, also the uh, binary data in there as well as base for 64, or we can with very large sites on migrations, uh, we can actually store the blob path key there. You copy the blob storage and then on import, you look at the blob path key and you recreate the blob connection again from the metadata part in the ZWB back to the blob storage that saves a lot of uh, data. But I still prefer for this particular use case to have it in base 64 because I would like to copy some staging content from one site to another. Use case from a customer. We have an international English website and they want to uh, launch new marketing campaigns. But the whole uh, setup so far has been that the subsidiaries worldwide of this uh, uh, customer, Zelandia, is uh, all delegated. They have their own site, they have their own freedom to do things, but still you want to kind of uh, uh, avoid doing double work. So if you have separate sites that were launched at different uh, periods in time, um, it's, it's difficult to just copy uh, uh, content around until they start recreating it. So that was like, hey, wait, what if we could export the content from the main site where we create a folder with a landing page, some easy forms, background content and pages. We can export it using collective export import to a JSON file, go to the subsidiary site, import the content again, and ask the local uh, uh, subsidiary marketeers to translate it, adapt it a bit to their local uh, use case. And we're there. So it has been tried before. We have a lot of different solutions for this. Um, it works best without any coding at all to have, uh, if you want to do this, to create a kind of portal sites with subsites, because then everything is in the single ZODB. And then it's, it's rather easy to do a copy paste from one part of your site to another subsite. Um, but as I said, if you're historically coming from a situation where subsidiaries have been added and added and added, and you have the the small uh, separate sites uh, approach for your organization, um, then this, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very interesting thing. And as I said, with content tree support, we can export uh, part of a site to JSON and we can then import it again in another site. Can we? So <laughs> the little problem we had with Celandia is that we also uh, provide them with mosaic layouts and mosaic layouts uh, are a feature that was not taken into account yet by export import. And especially not because we were so smart to use persistent tiles. And persistent tiles are not bad, they are a model, but those uh, persistent tiles store their data somewhere else. A little bit about mosaic layouts. So you have a behavior on a content type and it works just like the Volta blocks behavior and it adds a few fields. And uh, one of those fields is the content layouts, which is just a structure of diffs. And the diffs refer to uh, tile types by a link. I will, you will show, see uh, an example later. And the tile data, so the, the, tile, the, the data displayed in the tile, just like the data displayed in a photo block, is either stored in an URL encoded part in this main content layout, or it's stored on the context of the item itself. And that's what basically most of the blown up standard tiles, uh, tiles do. Or we have a persistent mapping annotation on the context stored with an ID. So when we first started testing this, uh, all of our uh, uh, normal content actually was already migrated. Even easy forms uh, were just migrated and exported and imported by collective export import because it just loops over all the uh, schema fields in the, in the schema. But the persistent mappings were missing. So this is how uh, in the content layout, uh, persistent tile is mentioned. So we have a diff 
uh, with a data tile that is of type clone app standard tiles HTML. And then there's an ID following to the annotation. So we asked my uh, colleague Maurits, uh, also known as our release manager, um, Maurits, can we fix this? Can we use the dict hooks that uh, Philip has built into export import and do something there? And yes, we can. So I'd like to try and start a demo video. I hope it starts auto playing. If not, I'll just minimize. Just play. And it doesn't go there. Somebody very smart said 30 seconds before I started the presentation, didn't you test? No, I didn't. So we'll just do it like this. There it goes. So what we see here, I have, this is on the one of the testing environments of Salandia. If you develop clone sites, always have a testing environment. And we have a mosaic layout here, which is created on the salandia.com testing environment. And we're going to the export content view. You can select the content here and the path. And of course, we leave uh, the included blobs as base 64 encoded strings. So we are not going to use the blob path trick because this is not a huge migration of a 80 gigabyte blob storage. It's just the content of a few items. And we export a little trick. We export the JSON not to a local file uh, on the client, but we export it to a shared folder on the server. So exported them to the shared folder on the server. That's the path. And now we can go to another site. So we have like 20 sites, also bad practice, but historical. We have them running uh, uh, multiple sites in some ZOAP servers. So that's where the shared directory is coming from. We share this export uh, and import directory with four ZOAP servers. Then we go to the import content view. We select our marketing campaign and we import. So we've imported four items, that's correct. And now if we look in the folder, there should be something there. And there we are. So as you can see, we only exported the content tree now. So for example, the default page, there was a mosaic a document with a mosaic layout there and it didn't have the default page here. So that's something we now have to manually fix up. Then when I go into mosaic layout, you see it's there. You can just add it, you can just do it, it works. So that's the basic demonstration. And this is in use now by uh, Celandia on some of the sites to export for some of their marketing campaigns also already in production. But there are some, so how, do, how did we pull this off? Um, we have created a dict hook on export and we just, we check uh, if the layout view has been set and we check if I layout behavior adaptable is also available in the context. And then we loop over all the annotations. We see if the annotation starts with flowing tiles data and we export the whole tile data with JSON compatible value. And JSON compatible value is coming from Plum REST API as well. That's a bit where the magic happens. So JSON uh, compatible has some adapters converters, um, but we have to re-register re them as well because the context is not a content type, but the con uh, context in this part is uh, a persistent mapping. So we have registered three uh, uh, adapters now for the most common use cases, rich text, named file and named image because those are field types that are not just basically functioning but just saying okay field is value and we do an extra trick we add an extra uh, item to the convert to the to the dictionary in json on export which is converter so we say look converter this was a rich stack that's now in the json then when we import we create a new persistent mapping we look at that converter key and then if the converter is rich text, we, uh, we import a JSON and we have a sub other uh, uh, function that says create a rich text. You can see it on the right side. We have create a named image and we have create named file. And we restore the annotation on the context. And that's it, that's how it works. So what we would like to have is, is a more generic system here. So the limitations here are 
um, that not all field types yet are supported here. So we're kind of with the dict hooks are manually fixing wicks, and we would like to have uh, better adapters uh, for all the fields there. And another thing we bounced into is that we are exporting from an English site, but for example, we're going to import on a Greek or a Spanish or a Polish or on whatever site. So we kind of smartly look what the default language is and we set all content to that one so that after that, the content uh, editors can uh, translate the items. And another thing we noticed, uh, uh, what we need actually is we have this um, converter key now. It would be nice if we know exactly what the schema was on the persistent mapping of the tile. So I've already created an extra mapping now that has annotation ID and maps it to the tile type. We are exporting that. And then we can uh, uh, maybe also with the extra adapters completely go schema based. And then we're almost there of doing this. Uh, one important category of field types still missing is the relation value and the relation list, uh, which we are working on now. So add more adapters. We have already a lot of these converters uh, but but we need to add them, and it's not the, it's not the portlets. It, it's it's also this problem is also here in portlets, uh, and it's also in uh, uh, in in photo blocks and other things. So we have multiple places where we have to convert the schema. So possible um, pum, 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 tips and tricks. Mm -hmm. Ah, sorry, that's not working. How much time do we have left? Two minutes. Oh, that can be long. So. Chicken and egg for problem of metadata. What we turn is when we export uh, uh, relations on tiles, we run into the same issue with we have on normal relation uh, related items on context. Uh, so we have to fix some stuff there. Uh, going to wrap up, um, we're going to could we create a generic bundle format for exporting content with all this metadata and content tree ordering, right? And then could we get it back into uh, could we get it back into the um, a system in one go where we separate the metadata from the content tree. So experience, it's a lot of low level work, um, but the actual data in a flow site has become much clearer for me. Uh, there is apparently a right order uh, to first export the content and then reapply the metadata again. And by using extract transform loads, you have a much faster feedback loop on the content that's there. You can first export everything and then use the JSON to import stuff again. And once it works, we can improve the tool for everybody, which is what ha what's happening now in collective export import. Tips and tricks, keep a log of which order you did things, uh, also with output so that you can verify 100 items in or 100 items out. You can create a helper add-on for your project uh, where you can override the default ones. What, what I did, I just forked collective export import in a branch, made the fixes there and use that in my project. There's some really handy tools here because we're not there yet on uh, default. Collective migration helpers can help you uh, to have some fixes in the third step I showed here in here, but those are being moved into collective export import. A very nice tool is collective search and replace because you can search for old uh, table classes, for example, in clone three or clone four sites and use regex to replace all the rich text there. Um, and collective relation helpers has a very cool uh, control panel where you where you import relations you can actually ex inspect them and see if they're already there one thing there don't bother to uh, import the link integrity relations i did that for multiple hours but you can just call update link integrity information in your target site and then it's all there back again so mind your step this is the ordering what you should do check this space also very important so if you have a 10 gigabyte uh, import, then uh, temporary files get created. We have to figure out if that's not necessary or not. But if you use the blob path trick, then not, none of the blob things are created. There's some code in, in, in Flow now that does this on the, on the base 64 import. Oh yeah, and the biggest thingy, initialize the site. If you have not selected the default language yet and you start importing content that has this language field, then the basic clone validators will barf at you and say, you can't create the content. So that's it to be done. I think Philip already said it. There's a lot to be done. Uh, we could use a lot of help. Uh, and this is not done for photo yet. That's also something we'll have to see uh, on the next project if we can go directly uh, uh, from a plan four side to a plan six. We'll have to fix the folders pages. We have to convert the rich text and we'll have to convert collective cover mosaic to blocks layout. So thank you.
Fred, thank you very much. Those are amazing tips and tricks. Uh, sounds like the pain, the voice of painful experience is going to be used again in great productive ways for the Plum community. So thank you. Um, please join us in the Jitsi. Thank you very much, Fred. Look forward to seeing what else you're going to do for Plum because, man, you don't do enough. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Kim, for presenting.